1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 4. It says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. What I, I think seems obvious that we need to understand from this passage is that every gift that is given, is given by the same Spirit. There are many different gifts, but it is the same Holy Spirit who gives every single gift. So every gift, though different, is honored in the same way. We understand through this passage that it is necessary for spiritual gifts to be present in the church. And in order for spiritual gifts to be present in the church, then we need to be aware of those gifts that we have, but we also need to be aware of those gifts that we need. A gift that I do not have that someone else has, I need that gift. There will be at some point that I need that. Or I know someone who needs to have a, an experience with that gift, so I know that I want that gift to be present in the church. If we want people to be healed in the church, then we all need to have a desire for gifts of healing, whether or not we need healing personally or not. We all need to desire wisdom to be present in the church, whether in this moment in our lives we need wisdom or not. Now, I don't know how you are, but here's what I know about me. I tend to not really care about something that I don't need. If I'm driving and I have a full tank of gas, I will pass multiple gas stations and I don't even notice them. Why? because I'm full of gas. I don't need gas. If my straw drink is full, I don't need to pull into McDonald's. However, if my straw drink is empty, I do. If my gas tank is empty, then I do. And so we need to understand that at all times in the body, whether there's something that we need or not, there is something that someone else needs. And so in the body, we are aware of the needs that surround us so that we can desire the fullness of spiritual gifts to be within us. Now, let me explain some of this because we, we got into this a little bit last week. We put it out there. I need to make sure we drag it along with us through each week. It opened up, this chapter opens up by saying that he does not want the church to be uninformed concerning spiritual gifts. The word gifts is just added there. What he says is, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spirituals. Spirituals, what, is, what does that mean? That means everything that we would receive from the Spirit of God, all of it. He says there are gifts, there are there's service, there are activities. There is all of this that is present. He gives a list of nine, and then he goes on and talks about another one, two, three, and then he talks about another one, and if we jumped all the way over to Romans 12, he's gonna list seven more, and then if we backed up to Ephesians 4, he's gonna talk about five more. So all in all, listed, there will be 22 different gifts. And what happens is we tend to elevate the ones that maybe seem to be, to us, more important than the other. And when we do that, we don't desire the fullness of God's rhythm in the church. Why? Because we think we don't need something. The church needs everything. And everything that the church needs, 
flows from the Spirit of God. There's a tendency in us to say, well, this list is more important than this list. Take, for instance, 1 Corinthians, if we kept on going, chapter 14 and verse 5. It, Paul says, look, I want you all to speak in tongues. But more than that, I want you to prophesy. For the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks with tongues, unless someone interprets so that the whole church may be built up. So the purpose of spiritual gifts is to build us up. And this is why he says prophecy is actually better than speaking in tongues. So then we think, okay, well, see, this list has prophecy. It's bigger. But the list in Romans chapter 12 has prophecy too. So if prophecy is greater and it's in both lists, what does that mean? Both lists are extremely important and one is not greater than the other. The same is true of the list in Ephesians 4. So I'm just saying this because we're going to put things sort of in an index, and we're going to go through them in somewhat of a sequential order. We'll skip a few and then drag it in as we talk about something else where it might be a little more tangential or maybe it, it fits in better there. But in the end, here's what I want you to understand. This is the takeaway. Let me give it to you right now. You can go home, and this is the takeaway. Come back in eight weeks. <laughs> be aware of the gift that God has given you. Because the gift that God has given you, you need to use in his church. And desire for every single gift that you don't have to be manifest in the church as well. The rhythm of this conversation surrounding spiritual gifts does the same thing in all three chapters and all three books. He will talk about gifts. He will talk about the body. He will talk about love. Every single time. It's the same rhythm every single time. Why? Because if all your emphasis is on a gift and you don't understand who the gift is for, the gift that you have will not operate because the purpose of the gift that you have is for someone. If you don't love people, you won't have a desire to help people. If you don't have a desire to help people, your gift is worthless. Because in the end, we keep saying your gift, and I will say this over and over and over and over, but what you need to fully embrace is the gift that God has given you is for the common good, meaning it's for someone else. So when you embrace the gift, in order for that gift to operate, you have to embrace also the people who need the gift. So I have to love people which is why he talks about love all three times. He also talks about the body all three times. We have to recognize that there is an embrace of everyone around us and the giftedness that they have because the giftedness that they have, it all flows from the same source. What is that? The Spirit of God. Who is that? The Spirit of God. So let's just throw this out and then we'll jump into utterances of wisdom and we will go a lot faster than we did at nine. That means you have to listen like really well this, this morning. All right, so in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, there is this prophecy. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We see these seven different mentions that will fully rest on the one who this prophecy is about. Now, don't get a little nervous when we talk about seven different um, principles or seven different flows or seven different manifestations or extensions of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly the way that people would see the Spirit of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Zechariah saw these seven lamps that were in a singular bowl before the presence of God in the Old Testament. John, who was the best friend of Jesus when he was given a vision of heaven, he saw these seven burning flames before the throne of God. He said, these are the seven spirits of God. Are there seven spirits? No, there is one. But there are flows or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in this prophecy in Isaiah, that all of it, Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, all of it flowing from the same spirit. These seven mentions will all be upon the one whom they're prophesied to be upon. Then we see that manifest in the life of Jesus and actually affirmed or confirmed in John chapter 3 and verse 34. It says, for he whom God sent, who utters the words of God, will be given the spirit without measure meaning the fullness of the Spirit of God prophesied in Isaiah 11 was upon 
Jesus, he whom God sent. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word became flesh. Jesus said, I've been sent from my father. So the one who was sent, the word who was in the beginning with God because the word was God. God came in the flesh and upon God in the flesh, the spirit of God in full measure came upon him. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because Jesus has the full measure of the spirit of God. We do not. Because we don't, it forces us We must have dependence on each other so that we see the fullness of the Spirit of God in his house and among his people. If I don't embrace your giftedness, there is a measure of God that I won't see. We all saw it in Jesus. We can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see all the things that he did. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He, like, did it all. You won't. I won't. We will. And when we get that... There is this like working arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with the people of God. We have this not just tolerance of each other, but we embrace one another. Look at it like this. This this is like a super obvious example. Um, Watch these gifts sort of happen. We all talk about the moment when Jesus multiplied bread and fish. We talk about him feeding the thousands And we so emphasize the multiplication. Why? Because we really like talking about working of miracles. Like, well, I do. I like talking about working of miracles. I think miracles are awesome. I think the idea of miracles is just mind-blowing. But put this in perspective. Jesus multiplied what someone else gave. So a gift of generosity that we would see in Romans 12 actually was a precursor to the working of miracles that we would see. The the child was generous first. Then Jesus took the generous gift and he multiplied it. And then the multiplication was distributed to pods of people that were in groups of 50 and 100. They were just in a mosh pit of thousands. And then Jesus told his disciples, go organize them in groups of 50 or 100. So they went and they brought order to the chaos. And when they brought order to the chaos, the generous gift that Jesus multiplied was then distributed Meaning people served. People went out with what Jesus multiplied and served. If Jesus just multiplied a stack of bread and fish, but the guy in the back couldn't get up there to it, was it any benefit to him? No. Because there'd be 500 selfish people in the front that would sit there and eat way too much bread and way too much fish, and the guy in the back would starve. But what happened? No, no, no. Jesus put them in pods of people where there was order and where there was flow, and then people took from the miracle and served others. What is that? That is every single gift working in the body so that all, the gifts are for the common good, so that all ate and there was even left over. It's amazing when you think about it. But it flowed from everybody using their gift. And when we get that, we will embrace the fullness of what God has, not only for us, but what he has for everyone that surrounds us. So um, let's do this. Let's, um, let's look at an utterance of wisdom. Let's talk about wisdom for a minute. When we talk about wisdom, we're going to talk about this actually in, in this entire grouping. So these nine gifts we put in kind of three sections. Um, you remember when you're growing up, you learned about the food groups. When I was growing up, there were five food groups. I think there are more now. I don't know how we've made more food groups, but whatever. We have more food groups. And um, they take these, and for years, decades, generations, they have taken these nine, and they put them in three sort of sections. And one of those are revelation gifts, and then there are power gifts, and then there are spoken, or what we would call inspiration gifts. And so the revelation gifts are here, utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, and then the ability to distinguish between spirits. These sort of function in a similar way, and they do a similar thing, so they put them in a group. And then there are power gifts, working of miracles, gifts of healing and faith. We kind of put those in another group. These are power gifts. Makes sense? And the next one, vocal or inspirational gifts. They, they inspire. And so we have prophecy, 
and we have speaking in tongues, and we have interpretation of those tongues, and we have those over here. And so let's just talk about this first batch today, if you don't mind. Let's talk about an utterance of wisdom first. Now, there is wisdom that comes upon us, and there is wisdom that is within us. There are people who are wise, and there are people who receive an utterance, or utterances, plural, of wisdom. And there is a difference. I could sit down right now and I could type out 98 words a minute. That's what I could type out. It's actually beneficial for me to be able to type because I have to type a lot of emails to people. I have to answer a lot of questions to people. It's good that I can type fast. I also have this weird gift where I can read out loud pretty quick. There is, uh, the average person will read out loud 183 words a minute. I can read out loud 428 words a minute. It's like really fast. And you're like, yeah, I know. I have to listen to you every Sunday. <laughs> But the good news about that is because people come to church less often and people used to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you could talk slower, you could talk for 30 minutes and in the end of the week, you would get what you needed to get. Now, because you only come once or once a month, I have to give you an entire month worth of information in one service. So be glad that I can do the 428 words a minute even though the average is 183, literally. Okay, but that's just a, that's a skill it's a wisdom that is within me. I can dial it up at any time. There are things that you can dial up at any time. You can just do them. Somebody can come talk to you about economics or they can talk to you about sports stats and you can just, you just do it. If you're a builder, somebody can say, I need you to build me something. You can grab some tools, grab some uh, materials and you can build stuff. It's what you can do, it's in you. But when we're talking about an utterance, it's going to come upon you. There's a difference. When we're doing what is from within us, there is a conventional wisdom that we are flowing from. It is within, we have it. When it's an utterance of wisdom, it's novel, meaning we're not drawing from something that we have already learned or have already done. We are just simply being given wisdom for the moment. And the reason why an utterance of wisdom is necessary, and especially, especially in 2022, is because we are absolutely facing things that we haven't faced before. So we're going somewhere that we don't have a map already in place to get us there. So because we don't have a way to get there, we need wisdom, not just from within us, but we need an utterance of wisdom, novel wisdom, new wisdom for a new path. In the absence of that wisdom, we will continue to do the things we've always done and we'll do them well, we just won't do something new. And when we don't do something new, we can't reach who we haven't reached. When we don't reach who we haven't reached, we won't be able to have a usefulness in the generation where God has placed us. Because here's the thing, I don't care how old you are, you're called to this generation. What is this generation? All of us who are alive. Like everybody likes to say, oh, you know, 25 year olds. Just, I, look, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, if you're alive, you're in this generation. Like, it's real simple. We all have to shop at Ikea. We all have to deal with the same stupid roads. We have, like, all of us. Okay, maybe I'm the only one that has to go to Ikea. <laughs> but this is the generation where God has placed us, so there is a calling upon us to reach who hasn't been reached. Because here's what we know. If we dig back, reach back too far, what was done 50 years ago probably will not be effective today which is why an utterance of wisdom gives us a strategy and a movement that is necessary for right now. Because without it, we don't know what to do. You don't have to raise your hands, probably better if you don't. But how many of you have ever been in a moment where you needed to know something to do, you had something in front of you, a decision to make, and you just didn't know what to do? Maybe it was because of your kids, maybe it was business, maybe it was just because things change so drastically in the world and you realize something's not working that has always worked, which is good to know, but it's not helpful in some ways because you still don't know what to do about it. There are a lot of times, okay, sure, I can tell you what's wrong, but what do I do about it, right? And so an utterance of wisdom brings to us from the Spirit of God, a wisdom, a strategy that without it, we would have no idea. So I just want to make sure we're understanding the difference in what is within us 
and what is coming upon us. So let's jump back to the Old Testament, kind of walk through this. We see this first probably in the ministry of Joseph. If you're new to church, let me just explain to you who Joseph is. He is the great grandson of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 kids. Joseph was one of those kids. Joseph was liked by his dad more than any of the brothers. The other brothers didn't like it. So they basically sold him into slavery and now he finds himself in jail. He's in jail now, and he meets somebody, interprets a dream. This person realizes that, that Joseph has wisdom. Now the person that Joseph was in jail with, now he's among the king's court, and in that court, he hears the, uh, I say the king, the Pharaoh, he's in the Pharaoh's court, and he hears Pharaoh asking his wise men about interpreting a dream. Well, they have no idea how to interpret it. They don't have a they don't have a reference, they don't have a baseline, they don't know what is going on. And so they just sit there mute. And then the guy in the corner says, hey, I met a guy in jail that can help you. Now you know you're desperate when there's just a random guy in the corner of the room that you don't even know his name, and he shows up and says, hey, I know a guy. I mean, he's in jail, we gotta go get him, but I think he can help you. So this is exactly what they do. It's like, the story is so bizarre. And so they, they go get Joseph, and they bring him in, and um, Pharaoh says, look, I've had these, these dreams, and I need to tell you about them. And I love the humility of Joseph right out of the gate. He says, hey, I don't have your answer in me. What is he saying? What you need, I'm not going to answer from what's in me, from what I know. He said, but God will show you. So he's saying it's not inside, but I'm going to be dependent on an utterance of wisdom. I'm going to be dependent on the, uh, the capacity, the ability to discern. I don't have it within, but I know God will answer. And so Pharaoh goes on and he says, okay, so here's what happened. I saw seven really healthy cows, and then there were seven really weak cows, and the seven weak cows ate the seven healthy cows. And after they ate them, they looked no healthier. Or actually, they looked just as terrible. And I've never seen cows this pathetic anywhere in Egypt. That's what he said. And then he says, now there was another thing that I saw, and that was like stalks of corn. And there were seven really plump um, corn cobs. And then there were seven really pathetic corn cobs that took over the seven healthy ones. And Joseph says, okay, here's basically what God is giving me. Because you've seen the same dream twice, what it means is this isn't one of those things that will happen if. This is declared by God, it will happen no matter what. You know, sometimes God gives us a word and he says, if you do this, then I will do that. And sometimes we don't see God do that and we want to blame God. The problem is we didn't do the if part. He would have done the then part, we just didn't do the if part. This was not one of those prophecies. This was, this is going to happen no matter what prophecy. And he knew that because he, he doubled it. He said it twice. So Joseph then says, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be seven amazing years. And those seven amazing years that are abundant years, that are full years, they're going to be followed by seven years of famine. And in the seven years of famine, basically the nations are going to starve. And so here is my strategy to you. So the first thing he did was discern the meaning of the dream discernment flowed first, and then he moved into wisdom. He said, here's what I would do. I would appoint someone to manage the seven abundant years, and then the same person distribute from the abundance during the lean years. And what we're distributing is one-fifth that we save from the seven abundant years. One of the problems that we probably all have is when we have good years, we're never saving. We're always just spinning, 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 and then we get to some lean years, and we're like, ah! And we put stress on ourselves that we shouldn't put on ourselves because we weren't saving during the abundant years. Whole nother conversation, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, so this was, this was the, the, the wisdom that flowed through Joseph. And so when he's done, then we see this conversation in Genesis 41, 38. Pharaoh says to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? And they... Gave him no answer. And then it said, Pharaoh turned to Joseph. And he said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise 
as you are. And he made Joseph the point person to manage the abundance and distribute in the weak times. He gave Joseph this position of authority. And in giving Joseph this position of authority, actually there was the fulfillment of prophetic dreams that Joseph had when he was a kid. So sidebar, whatever God has shown you, when you obey him, he'll bring it to pass. Don't give up. Don't walk away. If God promised you something, God will perform what he promised. He did it in the life of Joseph. He will do it for you. And so here in this moment, we see both discernment or the ability to distinguish between spirits and we see wisdom. This wisdom was a wisdom that came upon Joseph. It was an utterance. Now we see wisdom again later on in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 3, but it's a different kind of wisdom. God told Moses, go and speak to all the skillful in whom I have filled with a spirit of wisdom. Now, where is the wisdom in Exodus 28? It's within them. That's where the wisdom was. It was in. Where was the wisdom in um, Genesis 41? It came upon him. The wisdom of Genesis 41 was an utterance of wisdom. The wisdom of Exodus 28 was just being filled with wisdom, with a spirit of wisdom. Both gifts are necessary. They're just used at different times for different reasons. We don't elevate one above the other because both are necessary. Let me ask you this. Do you really care if your car needs to be fixed? Do you care if the mechanic knows how to fix it or if you have to have a prayer meeting to get the answer to get your car fixed? You just want your car fixed. So it doesn't matter to me if somebody is filled with wisdom or they receive wisdom. I just need somebody with some wisdom to fix my car. Just me. But when there isn't the wisdom within to do what I need, then I must be dependent and cannot shut off spiritual gifts so that I'm open to an utterance of wisdom. Why are we talking about this for the next few weeks? Because here's what is happening. There are people who have walked outside of the usefulness of giftedness. They have abused gifts. They haven't seen gifts work. And so people are saying there's no such thing as spiritual gifts. And we're kind of dropping back and we're just following conventional wisdom. And no one's open anymore to an utterance. I'm just trying to remind us that utterances of wisdom are necessary and they have always been present and they have always been active among God's people. So we can't shut the door. We cannot shut the door. Um, and, and for you, like you say, okay, well, well like, I mean, I, I think maybe I have this giftedness, like, but I don't see it happen like Joseph. There are measures of gifts. It doesn't all happen on a stage. It doesn't all happen in Pharaoh's court. Um, let, me, let me say this. I like, to, I like to throw football. I know last year I gave a couple of football examples. Some people don't like football anymore. I, I still like football. Um, I won't talk about it, but I, you know, just, I like football. All right, so I'm throwing, I like throwing football with my kids in the front yard. Like, I enjoy that. If you watched me throw football with my kids in, in my yard that's, I don't know, like, 60 feet wide, whatever. You would think I could actually throw a football. You'd watch me, you're like, man, this dude's throwing dimes. If you were doing a pickup game, you'd want me on your team. The, the problem is, once you run past about 15 yards, I can't get it any further. I'm only accurate from here to the front row. If you go over there to the back camera, you're just running by yourself. So if it takes you 15 yards to outrun the guy that's with you, I'm no good, because I can't throw it that far. Make sense? Why? Because I have a measure of a gift. All of us have a measure of a gift. And the thing is, the measure that we have is actually useful for where we are. It's, it's not that it's not as necessary. It's all necessary. Somebody's wisdom might reach 100. Someone's wisdom might reach five. Here's what I know. The five still need it. Are they, are they less valuable than the 100? Absolutely not. So whatever measure we have, we move in that gift. And a lot of times these gifts will flow in a, they'll kind of, I want to say flow with our personality. What I mean is, um, it sort of feels normal to us. Like take my dad, for instance. My dad is one of the wisest people 
He's, he's probably the wisest person that I know. I think that would be fair. I mean, I don't want to be too pandering. He's on the front row. <laughs> but, but he's extremely wise. His wisdom, though, has been the flow of a giftedness. He actually moves in. He has utterances of wisdom, and he has them right along. And so God speaks to him a wisdom, and then that wisdom is, might be for somebody, might be for him, but once he has it, like he just keeps, he keeps it, meaning he, he moves in that. He continues to do things that God has told him to do, and it just makes sense to him. Now, he's not as much into um, fixed things, like organization. He's not an extremely organized person. My mom is an uber, uber organized human. So they make a pretty good mix. Like he just leaves stuff, she goes behind and organizes it. Two gifts working together, it's great. But here's the thing, he loves the whole, the wisdom, the strategy conversation, the, the sort of, um, the chaos of it. Like, he, he just likes to talk about things that may or may not be. I hope you get this. So here's one of the things about him that I don't like to do. If I'm riding in the car with him and I see road construction, I'll go the other way. The reason I go the other way is because he'll go past road construction, he'll just start pontificating. Here's what I think they're doing right here. They are probably putting in a turn lane, it's gonna go here, it might wrap around. It could be that they're going four lanes with us. I'm like, look, I don't wanna speculate about this. We could go online, we could look at the county plan, we could know exactly what they're gonna do. He's like, well, I know, but let's just talk about it. I don't wanna talk about it. The road diet on South Florida Avenue, I don't wanna talk about it. I don't care what they're doing, when they're doing it. Like, I don't wanna talk about it. So knowledge might not be the place that he likes as much as wisdom. Entrepreneurial people, founders, are usually in this wisdom category. It's just natural for them. It's, it's kind of risky. It's like, well, maybe, maybe not. Like knowledge, folks, this is defined. It's black, it's white, it's zeros and ones, it's linear. This, not so much. And if you're like, man, I just like things to be this, you're probably never gonna flow in an utterance of wisdom. It's, it's just against you. Like, you, you don't like that. But, but, I promise you, you need to be open to people who move with an utterance of wisdom and do not discount them because their flow is different from your flow. Because there will come a time, no matter how much you know, that there is a wisdom that God will show that is necessary for you to move forward. And if you're not open, you won't receive what you need. So there are utterances of wisdom, there's also wisdom that we have within us. Can't talk about wisdom without talking about Solomon. We had this moment in the life of Solomon. Solomon was the wisest person that ever lived. First Kings chapter four and verse 30 says, Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. So Solomon was the most wise person. He was the wisest person. And then we see this moment in 2 Chronicles chapter one where Solomon is going to go pray and he's gonna ask God for wisdom. Now here's what I love about this because it says Solomon went up to the altar that was built by Bezalel who was commanded by Moses. So Moses back in Exodus 28 chapter, uh, chapter 28 verse three goes to Bezalel and says you are skillful you have a spirit of skill in you. I need you to build this altar. He builds the altar from the flow of wisdom within him. And then years later, here is Solomon standing in front of the same altar, asks God for wisdom in front of the altar that was built by somebody with a flow of wisdom. And then Solomon says, God, give me wisdom and knowledge to go in and out before this people, this people who are yours, who are so great. And then God said, because you asked for this and you didn't ask for fame and fortune, I'll give you wisdom like has never been seen, but I'll also give you fame and fortune like has never been seen. And since that moment, the rest of us thinking we're gonna trick God, we go before God asking for wisdom and knowledge, but what we really want is fame and fortune. But he knows, so don't bother. But here's what I don't want you to miss. Solomon, asking for wisdom, receives it supernaturally in front of an altar that was built with the wisdom that a man had within him. Every single gift 
is necessary. All right, let's wrap this one up with discerning of spirits. Um, the ability to distinguish between spirits. This, this might be the most necessary gift in the next little bit. And I say that because we've been so terrible at it for the last couple of years. We really don't seem to know what's right and wrong anymore. Amen. We don't really seem to know whether it's God speaking or whether it's just somebody speaking. We get stuff wrong all the time, but we follow it because somebody puts a thus says the Lord tag. And then when it doesn't happen, then everybody's like, well, it didn't happen because the church didn't believe. Can I, can I just say this? If God gives a prophecy, not an if then, if he says this is going to happen, it doesn't matter if the church believes it or doesn't, it's gonna happen. Why? Because God said it was. Can't use people's unbelief as an excuse for failed prophecies anymore. We have to be smarter than this. And you look at me like, wait, really? Just take this, just take this, this simple, amazing illustration. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be raised from the dead in three days. That's a prophecy. That's Jesus saying, I'm going to be raised from the dead in three days. Nobody believed him. Nobody believed him. Thousands of followers, no one believed him. There was nobody at the tomb when Jesus was raised from the dead. The women were the only ones who were at least nice enough to go to the tomb, and they were there not to see an empty tomb, but rather to anoint the dead body of Jesus. I'm just letting you know, nobody believed. But what happened? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word that became flesh, that was crucified, who died for your sins, was raised from the dead, whether anybody wanted to believe it that day or not. When God speaks, God moves. So there's this moment in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 28 where Jeremiah had prophesied that if everybody just kept doing the wrong thing, that they were going to be essentially um, sold into exile and taken into Babylon. Not because God didn't like people, not because God suddenly was frustrated, but rather because there were a group of people that he kept warning and warning and warning and warning and they refused to listen to him. And then finally he said, okay, because you're not listening, this terrible thing, this consequence is going to happen. I just want to remind everybody that consequences existed then and consequences still exist now. So Jeremiah's prophecy was we're going to be taken into captivity and um, we're going to be there for 70 years. And uh, that's what happened. They were taken into captivity. And then this prophet shows up. Jeremiah had put this, this yoke on him. A yoke was just this big wooden beam that kept animals together so they could do work together. And he put it on to just demonstrate the plight of their people. And there was another positive prophet one of those that was always smiling, everything was always good. God was gonna put your guy where you want your guy to be. He was always that guy, always prophesying prosperity. And um, he went up to Jeremiah in front of all the people and he took the yoke, I mean, this is, this is bold. He takes the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah and breaks it. And in verse 11, he says, thus says the Lord, even so, Will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within two years? And everybody shouted. Everybody's like, yeah, God's going to move on our behalf. Yeah. Jeremiah just walked off like, yeah, we'll see. And then God arrested him and said, you go back and you tell them he lied to God's people and that he's not going to live. Jeremiah goes back. He says, you're going to die. You just lied to everybody. And in the seventh month of the same year, Hananiah died, and yet the people stayed in captivity for 70 years. Why? Because God spoke a word. And somebody came in, and they wanted to speak a different word, and it was good that someone could discern the spirit from which they were speaking. It is necessary for us to pay attention, not to just what is said, but what is the spirit behind what is said. It's necessary. It's necessary. Last thing we see in Acts chapter 6. Um, 
there was a moment where God's preachers were not able to use their gift because they were doing other people's, they were doing other people's gifts. And there was just this conflict. And there comes a time in our lives where we have to actually be aware of the gift that God has given us so that we can do the thing that we are supposed to do that no one else can do. Because someone else can do the gift that they're gifted to do, but you're the only one that can do the thing that you are gifted to do. And so the preachers were just doing everything instead of empowering people to use their gifts in the church. And then it came to the point that they couldn't use their giftedness anymore. And so in Acts chapter six and verse two, it said that the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. And they said, it is not good. It is not good that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men who have a good reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom that we may appoint to this duty. What you have that is a giftedness for a duty is different than a manifestation that we're talking about. They had a giftedness that was necessary to do these things, and they were called to do that. There also was a giftedness for these guys to preach, and they needed to do that, and they couldn't do both. Now, here's why I want to end with this. I want you to realize how important your gift is. He said it's not right that we should give up preaching the gospel. He didn't say it's not convenient. He didn't say it's not the best thing. He said it's not right. What is it that you are gifted to do in this season right now that you must do. I mean, let me talk to the parents for just a minute. Let me just let this get heavy, it's fine. We'll all survive. But there are things that other people can do well. There are other people that can coach, they're called coaches. They can teach your kids all kinds of great things. There are educators who are gifted educators. They can teach your kids things that they need to know. There's one thing, though, that parents are called, that parents are gifted to use for the sake of their children, and that is to teach them and discipline them in the fear of the Lord. That's your calling. No one else is going to do that. If you don't do that, it doesn't get done. And here's what I know. There will be a moment where it's you and Jesus standing in glory. And you better have them with you because nobody's going to stand before Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't see them, but they can do seven backhand springs in a row. Jesus, they can do three pirouettes. Jesus, they can throw a baseball 80 miles an hour. You'll never tell Jesus that. But what you will tell Jesus when they're next to you is, Jesus, I didn't get it all right. But one thing I got right, I taught them in the fear and the discipline of your name. And here they are. And I give them back to you. What are you gifted to do? What must you do that if you do not do, it will not get done? I promise you, it is worth reorganizing everything else. It is worth shifting everything else so that you can move in the giftedness and the calling that he has placed upon your life. Because when you get this right, I promise you, God will do more through you than you could ever imagine, and your life will have the greatest level of satisfaction than you dreamed of. I promise. Why? Because you were aware of God in you, and you were willing to use that gift for the common good. Amen. 